Didn't think it would take that long. Let me, clo <laughs> Let me close in prayer. In 1969, writer and activist for the cause of the Holocaust victims, Simon Wiesenthal, penned his thought-provoking book, The Sunflower. It was an autobiographical presentation. In raw emotion, with penetrating intellect, he captured his personal experience in one of history's darkest moments. The book is interwoven with his struggles in his search for freedom from guilt. He relates how he had been taken from the death camp to a makeshift army hospital and he was surprised one day to be taken by a nurse and ushered to the side of a Nazi soldier who had asked for a few private moments with a Jew. He was brought face to face with a critically wounded man who was bandaged from head to foot. The soldier unburdened his heavy heart and said that he had committed such atrocity. He set a town on fire and the entire village with women and children and men were burned to death. And he couldn't get out of his mind the haunting of the screams as they died in such agony. He was unable to silence his mind. And he pleaded with the Jew to extend to him forgiveness. But as Wiesenthal stood by his bed, he asked himself the question, how can I forgive when they had done so much to destroy the Jews. He had lost himself personally, 89 of his family members. And so he paused by that bed while that Nazi soldier pleaded for forgiveness to somehow rid himself of guilt that he had. And after a long pause, Wiesenthal left the room and said nothing. But it so haunted him that he felt he needed to find out whether he made the right decision. And so he wrote 32 men and women of high regard and he asked them, having told them the story of what happened, if he had done the right thing. 26 responded and said, yes, he did the right thing. Six of them suggested he should have taken the high road and extended forgiveness and pardon. Guilt. Someone has asked if we'd look at the topic guilt in our You Asked For It series. Uh, last week, we looked at forgiveness, and a very close association with forgiveness is guilt, because guilt produces in us the need to seek forgiveness and to extend forgiveness. Both of these people in this story that Wiesenthal talks about in the hospital, they struggled. One was seeking forgiveness, and the one was guilty for not having extended it. You'll remember the lines in Shakespeare, the cries of Lady Macbeth. She spurred her husband to murder King Duncan and seize the throne. And after the murder, she smeared blood on the sleeping guards to implicate them in the murder. But the plot focuses later, you'll remember, on Lady Macbeth, walking in her sleep night after night, staring at the hands she pleads, out, damned spot, out I say, one, two, here's the smell of blood still, all the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh, oh, oh. The heart of guilt. If you were to sit alone with somebody who has gone through serious depression or one who is lonely or struggled in marriage problems or someone who's dealt with alcohol abuse or drug abuse or facing other challenges, you would find that underneath, at the very root, 
there can be tremendous guilt. What do you do with guilt? There are organizations that have been established to help people with guilt. And I read this. I thought this was rather fascinating. There's an organization in Los Angeles. It's called an Apology Sound Offline that has been created. People have an opportunity to confess their wrongs, call in to leave their confession on an answering machine. <laughs> they have a 60-second time slot, so they have to fit it all in in 60 seconds. They have an average of 200 calls a day from people who so desperately want to confess their sin. It's incredible to observe how we deal with guilt. How do we deal with guilt? What are some of the ways we deal with guilt? What would you suggest? Why don't you start us off, because usually you do. <laughs> well, I think sometimes we just turn our cheek and just tend to ignore. So we ignore guilt. it. Okay, we can ignore it. What else can we do? Right? Rationalize it. It really wasn't as bad. Yes, David. Right? Okay. Beat ourselves up. It keeps coming back. Never really resolve it. Deal with it. What else? That's a big one. Blaming someone else. If my parents hadn't been so irresponsible in raising me, I wouldn't be the way I am today. If the woman I married, now we learned that from Adam. <laughs> we learned that from Adam. You remember the Lord, look, God looked for him. They were hiding, trying to cover themselves because they found themselves naked. Da, da. And Adam said, it's the woman you gave me. Imagine blaming God for his sin, his guilt. What else? Anything else? Compensation. Compensation? In what way would you say compensation? Uh, something else to offset the bad. Right. Maybe some good to try to balance it off, would you think? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? We deny it. We use drugs, alcohol, immorality. I talked to a fellow just this week. I had lunch. And he said this, there are times that he has a struggle with lust. And he said, what he does is he rationalizes it and says, I deserve that. You know, I, I keep myself so pure that I deserve to lust on occasion. So we shift the blame to others. We blame society. We blame our environment. We blame our parents. We appeal to everything we can to escape the pain of personal responsibility. It's too much to handle. We learn how to harden our hearts. And the result of that, however, is anxiety and discouragement and fear of punishment and a sense of isolation. Now, what does the Bible say about guilt? I'm glad you asked because we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Pastor Jason last week talked about the fact that we, we sin when we disobey the law of God. We, sin is against God. And when we do break the law of God or the truth of God, we struggle with, with guilt. Now, Paul speaks to this. He addresses this. And I want you to notice there's something called what we would call constructive sorrow. I think I have this up here. Oh, goodness, they're there already. Constructive sorrow. Look at verse 7, if you will, or verse 8 of chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. I said some things to you in my letter that caused you pain, and I, I don't regret that I did. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, 
but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow, which is constructive sorrow, brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Um, worldly sorrow would be I, uh, I'm passing you something at the dinner table when you have Don and I over for lunch sometime, and I spill it down your good shirt or down your pants, and I say something like this, oh, how stupid of me. Look at the mess I've made. I'm, I'm sorry, I feel so foolish. My mother always used to tell me I'm a klutz. Now that's what you'd call worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow. I got caught and I'm stupid and I'm foolish. But constructive sorrow that Paul speaks of here says this, I'm sorry, here's a towel to clean it up and I will pay to get your clothes clean. You get your clothes cleaned at the dry cleaners and I will pay the bill. That is constructive sorrow. You want to notice as well, the, uh, the second concept we must understand is God's forgiveness. And for that, we're going to go over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. We'll focus our attention on Luke 15 and Luke 17 this morning. Forgiveness, as we heard last week, is an act of setting someone free. So I forgive you, not for your benefit, but for my benefit. When I refuse to forgive, as we heard last week, then I am bringing that pressure on me. So don't ever say, I can't afford to forgive someone for what they've done to me. Because when you say that, then you hold yourself in bondage. The freedom to forgive gives us the freedom from even the regret, if you will. Now, God's forgiveness. Um, there's a debt, and it's forgiven when you free your debtor of the obligation to pay back what he owes you. God's forgiveness has three elements. There's injury, there's debt, and then there's a cancellation of that debt. All are essential if forgiveness is to take place. Now let's talk for a few minutes about this thing called guilt. I'm going to propose to you that guilt is a gift from God. Guilt is a gift from God. Pain is a gift from God to let you know there's something going on that's not right in your body. Pain is a gift. You have a, an abdominal pain that persists for several days. You call the doctor, you see the doctor. You don't ask the doctor to give you some medication to somehow cover the pain. You want him to find out what? What's causing the pain. Because pain is the gift from God to help us understand what is going on inside of us. Anger is a gift from God. As physical pain is evidence of physical disability or challenge, anger is a gift from God to reveal that there's emotional pain going on. So that's why Jesus was able to say, be angry and sin not. Because anger is a gift from God that reveals that you've got some emotional baggage in here that needs to be dealt with. So you don't go to anger management classes to try to learn how to control your anger. You try to find out from maybe some professional help what it is that is causing you the internal pain that is evidenced in your anger. Now, as physical pain is, the physical hurt, 
An anger is to emotional hurt. Guilt is a gift from God because it gives us evidence that there is spiritual hurt or spiritual pain. So don't look at anger and say, oh, or guilt and say, oh, I shouldn't be guilty. I shouldn't feel guilty. I've got to deal with my guilt. What am I going to do with my guilt? We need to thank God for guilt because guilt, as, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, we've got to understand that guilt that is constructive guilt will motivate us to do something about it, not try to cover it up or not try to pacify it. Is that, is that understandable? You got that? Any questions about that? All right. Here you have, in, I, I love this 15th chapter of Luke. When I was a kid, I still remember the, the, the lost sheep and the lost coin. The lady who had 10 coins was going shopping, getting the shuttle bus to go shopping, and she only found nine of her coins. So she looked all over the house until she found the 10th coin, and then she had a party. Like the shepherd did, I, was, I often wondered, did the cost of the party <laughs> equal the cost, the value of the coin? That you, I don't know. But anyway, at the end of both of the, and there's only one parable, by the way. It's not three parables. There's one parable that's, that's shown in part A, part B, and part C. They had a big party, and Jesus said, by the way, there is joy in the presence of the angels of heaven over one sinner that repents. And so that's a great lesson for us. Now, the third part of that parable is the lost son. We don't know a lot of the particulars of the background, but all we do know is that he had a pile of, of money because it was a fairly wealthy environment in which he was raised, and he came to the understanding that he could take off and leave. And so he goes to his father and says, Dad, I'm tired of all the rules and regulations around here. You're yapping at me all the time to turn the music down in my room. I got to be in at 11 o'clock. Mother's always nagging me about what I'm eating properly or not properly. I'm going to be on my way. So I am leaving. I want you to give me the inheritance that if you and Mom kicked the bucket, that's what I would get. <laughs> that's in the reversed version, by the way. <laughs> And so he takes his money. I'm, I'm shocked. I don't know if I, as a father, would do that. But anyway, the parable says he, he was given the money. And the guy, it, I love the way the King James puts it. He, he spent his time in riotous living. In other words, he had a blast. Because when you got lots of money, you got lots of friends. I found that when I found my, my first car that I ever bought was a little Beetle Volkswagen, a little four-seater stick shift. And when I got that car, I had scads of friends I never knew I had, because they all needed a ride. And whenever the car wasn't working, I didn't have the friends the same as I did. And that's exactly what this guy found. He had lots of friends. He had lots of things to do with his money. But then his money ran out. And so did his friends run out. And he had no income. And so he got a job. We don't know how he got the job, if he got it through the unemployment insurance office or what. <laughs> but he got a job. Now listen to me. Can you imagine this job he's got? He's feeding pigs. Now, that has got to be about as low as you can go as a Jewish boy, would you not say? Here's this little Jewish kid. He's feeding swine. Jews had an aversion to swine, but he was feeding them. Now, I am not a farmer. I have no idea how to operate a farm. I used to think manure was what you did in your car in busy traffic. <laughs> <laughs> But, but th th I do know this. I do know that what you feed pigs is not really appetizing. Is that not true? Have you ever raised pigs? Do you have pigs? No, you get the more clean. Out. Who has pigs here? Is that true? That you, the, oh, you pigs? A thousand. A thousand pigs and the stuff you fed them. Have you ever looked at the food you were feeding them and said, you know what? I wouldn't mind some of this. You're not going to admit it. <laughs> 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 
Well, the kid looked at this stuff and said, you know what, this looks very good. And he started slurping up the stuff he was feeding the pigs. And he came to his senses, the text tells us, and he said, you know, my father has servants who are better off than I am. And I'm a son. I'm going to get up and go to my father, and I'm going to say, Dad, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I want you to make me as one of your servants. I love the difference if you want to parallel the prayers that he had. The first prayer he had was he went to his father and he said, give me, give me, give me. The second prayer in the pig pen was, Father, make me. Make me as one of your servants. There's a very big, very big difference between asking God to give us and asking God to make us. So he got up and he went home. Now, there's some fascinating things that that take place. Where is it here? Uh, Verse uh, 20. So he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And here's the son. He had practiced in the pig pen for so long exactly what he was going to say. Have you ever done that? You review and you review and you review. You got it down right pat. And he says, okay, here it is. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But, I mean, he didn't get the thing out. He only got the thing half finished. But the father said to his, uh, his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandal on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. There are some things I want you to observe from this about God's love. Number one, the Heavenly Father's love has no limits. That's the picture that we have here. The Father is a picture of God. So when you sense guilt, we need to understand that the love of God has no limits. You cannot go so far that God's forgiveness is no longer offered. That day will come. The day of mercy will one day shut when Jesus Christ comes again. But until then, his, his mercy is open. Number two, his love is patient. How long was the Son God? We don't know how long he was gone. We aren't told. But we know he was, long, he was gone long enough to spend lots and go through a famine and hold down a job. His love is patient. He is eager to express his love, verse 20, the verse that I just read. In the New Testament, no one who has dignity ran in public. That's a very interesting observation. You did not run in public if you were a man of that stature. But here you see God running toward the Son to embrace the Son. Number four, God's focus is on the sinner, not on the sin. Verse 21 Father, I've sinned against heaven, against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The son was focusing on the sin. So much like us, subjective. The father's focus was on the son, seemingly ignored the son's speech, embraced him and said, let's party. You have come home. And number five, God receives repentant sinners into fellowship joyfully. I thought this was an interesting part of the Roman Catholic prayer of contrition. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended you, not only because of the loss of reward or the fear of punishment, but because I have violated you. Sin is against God. Now, let's go over a couple of chapters to chapter 17 of Luke. Luke 17. You going to sing another song? What are you going to sing? If we have time. What do you mean, if we have time? I'll be finished by 12.15. You have a closing? What's it called? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. If I keep going too long, you just start singing it. We can multitask here, no question. Now, in chapter 17 of Luke, I want you to uh, watch as I read. 
Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. There are four distinct matters in this section. One is we need to be careful how we walk. I think if I have a great fear in my own, a, a, I hope it's a, a godly fear, is that someone would look at me and say, because of my life, they have turned away from Christ or they have fallen into sin. Um, a horrible thing to be the influencer of someone who, because we're all influencers, we have a sphere of influence. We need to be careful how we walk. I guarantee there are many Christians who are not walking with God today because of other Christians who've let them down and they become stumbling blocks. So Jesus made that fairly clear. Verses 3 and 4, we need to be careful how we forgive. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Oh, good night. Did you touch on this last week that from this passage? I did mention that. Did you mention that? What did you say about it? <laughs> Do you remember? Didn't you listen? I did listen. I want to know if you listened. It is. And, and you gave a great response as to how you do it. How do you do it? With God's help. With God's help. That's right. That's where we're, our that's a good answer. Excellent. <laughs> excellent. You did very well. If you didn't see that message, you need to get online and see it. It's an excellent message. So suppose someone puts a stumbling block in our way. What should our attitude be toward them? I think there comes, I don't think, the Bible says there is a time to go to him and rebuke him. You sit down and say, listen, there's something that's grieving me. I see some things in your life that concern me, and I want to talk to you about them. What's the best way to communicate them? Whatever way you feel God is leading you to do so. Uh, do you remember last week, you remember this very much, because I thought it was good. There were people standing up at the front, two people like this. Will, you were doing that. And Sarah, you were doing it as well, I think. The drawbridge, remember that? Very good illustration. And I think the whole idea, he talked about, he talked about repentance and forgiveness, which produces what? Reconciliation. Reconciliation comes when there is repentance. I have sinned against you and against God, and I want you to find it in your heart to forgive me. And then reconciliation comes when that person says, yes, I, I, accept, I accept that, I do forgive you. There's so much more that could be said about that. Uh, let, me, let me go on here. What page am I on? Oh, here we are, five and six. We need to live by faith. Verse five says, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith he replied if you have faith as small as a mustard seed now they're pretty small i understand correct you can say to the mulberry tree be uprooted and planted in the sea and it'll obey you now i've never tried that but you, you get the picture he's a, a bit of hyperbole there he's saying you know what it doesn't take a lot of faith it's just acting out your faith you know, I believe God said this, and I need to obey him, so I'm going to do it. And that's what needs to be done. The overwhelming response to this teaching, increase our faith, not our love or not our compassion. He said, in effect, you don't want more faith. We're not talking about bulk. We're not talking about quantity, but quality, because forgiveness is an act of faith. Handing over our guilt and responding to that is an act of faith. And number ver verses 7 through 10, we need to beware of pride. He says, suppose one of you have a servant plowing or looking after sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? 
Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, why? We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. What a great statement. I don't feel like forgiving you, but I'm by faith going to forgive you because that honors God. And the Lord himself said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So we need to be careful of pride. All right, in conclusion, let me say a few things here. What are some steps to resolving guilt? Okay, let's try that one and see if that comes up. Yes. What are some of the steps in resolving guilt? Number one, these come from Dr. David Augsburger in a book that he wrote entitled The Freedom of Forgiveness, excellent little volume. Number one, you face it. You face it. It's difficult because of the pain of admission. Because as we've already said, we try to cover it up, we blame other people, etc., etc. I love the story of David and Nathan the prophet. I think that is absolutely phenomenal. When David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, the next door neighbor, and then tried to cover up the pregnancy with killing her, oh, it was just bizarre. And then Nathan the prophet comes in and says, David, I'd like to tell you a little story. A little story is about a farmer and he had one little sheep. And the guy next door had scads of sheep. And a neighbor or friend came to visit the guy with lots of sheep. And he went over next door and took the sheep, the only sheep the farmer had. And Nathan said, that imbecile, how dare he do that? I will make sure that he pays for that. And Nathan sticks his bony finger in David's face and says, you are the man. How do you think he said that? I think he said it like that. You are the man. And suddenly, from Psalm 51, which is the Psalm David wrote about his, his guilt and the, the horror of that guilt, and yet that's what brought David to a point of reconciliation with God when he was able to say, I have sinned against God. And he says that in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned and done this dastardly deed. So number one, we need to face it. Number two, we need to confess it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, there's an S on that. It isn't just, Lord, forgive me for my sin. It's like there's such an awareness of sin that the moment we sin, we say, Lord, forgive me for that. I, I, I ask you for forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ. Forgive me. There's another side to confession, and that's allegiance to Christ and a dependence on him, as we've said. We cannot do this on our own. Lord, help me. I love that last part of Psalm 139 where he, he, after talking about the omnipresence of God, the omniscience of God, the omnipotence of God, he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see if there's any wicked way in me. I mean, that's the prayer we need to pray. Lord, reveal to me by your Holy Spirit. I, I'm open to hearing you. And when, he, when we face it, then we confess it. Number three, we need to forsake it. Forsaking your guilt has to do with constructive sorrow or repentance. That's what Paul said in the uh, outset of the talk, our chat today. And that is that there, there comes a point where we have, it's godly sorrow, it's constructive sorrow. It means being willing to turn from the source of our guilt and not live under that guilt anymore. Understanding that when I confess my sin to the Lord, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. Now, are there consequences? Yes, often we have to live with consequences to wrongdoing. But as far as the sin, I know I've talked to people who say, well, you know, Pastor, I know God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. And my response to that is, are you putting yourself above God? 
that God can forgive you, but you can't forgive yourself? Give me a break. Don't be so arrogant. Come to a point of saying, you know, the Lord has forgiven me. By faith, I've confessed it as wrong. I've tried to do whatever I can to make things right, and I'm going, not going to allow Satan to throw that in my face again. I need to forsake it. To do otherwise will result only in continuing false guilt that will destroy an opportunity for intimacy with God. There's a thing called false guilt. And, and so many of us, because we've, we've erred or we've had things in our life that we regret and we've confessed them, but we still feel the enemy throwing them in our face. We need to come to a point of saying, I forsake that. I am not going to allow Satan to control me any longer. And number four, we need to accept our freedom or live it. Live in the knowledge of the grace that God has extended to you. Here in conclusion, I want to leave this with you. Guilt. When expelled by irreverence, guilt makes life in mutual harmony unlivable. When smothered by pride, it makes one's life unaccountable. When concealed by fear, it makes the pain unbearable. When dismissed as cultural, it makes morality intenable. And when guilt surrenders to the grace of God, it makes the sin forgivable. So you may have come in this morning and you dragged with you your guilt. Let me leave you with two words. Stop it. Face it. Acknowledge it. You've sinned against God. Confess it. And reality is that God forgives us from our sin and then move on. Don't allow it to continue to control you. Any questions, thoughts, additions? What do you, is there anything you want to add to that? It seems pretty good or it is pretty good? I have a spelling error, which... What, where is it? When concealed by fear, it makes the pain unbearable. When concealed by fear, it makes the pain unbearable. Well, the main thing is unbearable. <laughs> That's rationalizing. I am sorry, I confess it. Father, we do thank you for the forgiveness that is available to each of us through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we realize that we are all sinners, but your grace extends to us, and for that we are grateful. And I pray for every heart in this place this morning. You know our hearts individually. And I pray that for those who are struggling with guilt, that we, you would give them hope. May they realize that you are more desirous of restoring them to a relationship with you than they could even be of being restored. And we thank you for the openness that you have to encourage us to come unconditionally to you and experience your grace for Jesus' sake. Amen.